All right, nerds. How the hell are you? I'm Taylor. Welcome back. Uh, this is the Cranky Comic Book Review Show. It's Wednesday. It's uh, November. No, it's October 26th. I don't know. Time is fake anyways. Dates aren't real. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. The earth is warming up. And uh, I don't know. We're probably getting a nuclear war. So let's talk about something meaningful like comic books. And yeah, as always, worst to best. Kind of a light week. Kind of a crappy week for books. Really, nothing... Fan, 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 fucking tastic, but we'll get into it. So here we go. And this one technically came out last week, and if it keeps up like this, which it's looking like it's going to, this might be my last uh, issue of this book, which is sad because it's one of my favorite characters. But we have Thor 28. Um, yeah, it's Ewing and Kate's together. I actually, I don't always love Donny Kate's. I really. You know, I'm a picky bastard, but like I enjoyed his Thor run for the most part. Although he did think make Thor into a mopey son of a bitch for a little bit too long. That said, still a fairly enjoyable series until that banner of Hulk or Hulk of War or hulking banner of your mom nonsense. That was god awful garbage. And this has not gotten better because now Al Ewing's on board as like this storyteller. I think they're transitioning it into the, being an Al Ewing book. And I no, I hated Al Ewing's Venom. Uh, I didn't really love his Defenders. I didn't, have not read Immortal Hulk, so I don't know. I heard that's good and bad and good and bad and good and bad. But whatever. I... Ugh, God, this is annoying. It, it's just... He brings in Venom, which he's writing, because you have to have the team of the other book you're writing, right? That's because... Uh, it's nonsense. And, and I get comics are nonsense. I get superhero books are nonsense, especially. I get Thor is grandiose nonsense. But it just... The tone doesn't feel right for this book. It's not capturing the essence that Donny Cates had before it, and it's going in a weird ass direction where it's now there's the, like really playing up the, th the fact that Go Thor is the god of it all, which was sort of going on, taken to the extreme. And uh, I don't know. I really, really hated this. I hated the dialogue. I hated the action. I hated everything about this one. And it saddens me because I like Thor. I have 27 issues of fairly fond memories of Thor. Well, 20, okay, really 24 to 25. That book did kind of take a dump after the death of Odin. And uh, this is the, might be the final dump in the coffin. I've not done research. I've not looked to see if Donny Cates is leaving the title, but I really wouldn't be surprised. Uh, you know, he's writing his own thing called Vanish and other things and Crossover and Your Mom. I didn't get Vanish this week either. The LCS was sold out of it, so... It is what it is. All right, next we have, this is a weird-ass one that I pretty much just picked up because it was a light week. And we have Dead Maul, number one from Dark Horse. Adam Cesare, uh, David Stoll, and Justin Birch on lettering. And I like Justin. Justin's a good dude. Justin, I liked your lettering on this book. Not that you're ever going to watch this, but whatever. Um, <laughs> this is a weird book. It's the setup issue to the first it's a, it's the first issue. It's a setup issue, and it's a horror book. If you in case you couldn't tell by the cover and the fact that it has Dead Mall on it, um, it's not it doesn't have a whole lot extra going for it other than it's told from a very odd point of view. And I don't want to spoil what that is in case you pick it up and decide you want to like it. But it's also like if you know if you read the title of the book and you. <sighs> You figure it out really quickly when you're reading it. How about that? And then you like you're like okay, you're waiting for something more to happen with it. We're like okay, I get what's going on, uh, and then nothing really else does. It just kind of is sort of tries to play up the horror tropes a bit, and it it, it doesn't do it horribly, but also not much really happens in this book other than that. Yeah, it's the start of a horror like thing <laughs> you know we're like all these kids are trapped together in the mall there i spoiled something for you you'll get that in the first page and then it just goes kind of it's you know it's a wonky book like it, it, there should be more happening to it the art's okay there's some panels that are really effective and there's some where it's like really weird action and like it's kind of sparsely drawn doesn't really fit the horror vibe all the time like the characters get a little too cartoony and it just doesn't quite fit I don't know. It's a we. It's an odd one. I liked it better than Thor, but I didn't really like it, and I'm not going to be continuing with it because um, it just didn't hold my interest. Like I, once you get past the the gimmick, and you're like, okay, yeah, 
give me give me a little more to work on. All right, next, um, another weird ass one, uh, especially just given that the I don't know, it's called Lovesick, right? It's a uh, Luana Vecchio, who I don't know, I probably should, but like I dig the cover, you know, dead pig face, and uh, yeah, and it's about the red rooms, the dark web for fun and profit. Oh no, way, that's Ed Piscor. Uh, but this your, this book is going to draw, uh, can it draw comics? Draw? It's going to draw comparisons to um, Red Room because it it like kind of apes some of the storytelling that like style that Ed Pisker set up in there. Um, the art's different. The art's not bad. It's like, I like the color palette. I like the kind of use of it all. And then it's just a, a strange story about Domino. Who's like the head of this sort of dark web thing, but it doesn't really talk about her all that much. So you don't really learn what's going on. There's a last page that's supposed to, I think be some kind of big reveal, but it's like, okay, that's, not, I don't know what that's revealing. Revealing. Um, there's a whole lot of variant covers coming up apparently, and it's it's fine if you're into body porn horror and you liked Red Room, you might like this. I didn't like this as much. It didn't really have that sort of really, even though it's got some grotesqueness and some imagery and like some blood spatteriness, it didn't really kind of catch me the same way Red Room did in the visceral nature of it. I mean, it's it's got the gore, I guess. It's just the tone was different enough in this that it, and I got, it's a different book. So it's supposed to have different tone. I understand all that. It's just, and I, and I, I and I do enjoy the art. It's just the, the, something about it was just a little off and okay. That might make, this might explain it. And I didn't read this until now. It's an English adaptation. So it's been translated. So I think there might be a little bit getting lost in the translation of it. Um, it, it doesn't, read poorly um it's got some weird use of like asterisks at the bottom of stuff and it's translating stuff that's already uh yeah it's 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 a little odd um yeah it, it, that's that's probably what it is it's like i don't think the translation works super well it's not not horrible it's not grand it's just kind of yeah it's all right um and it but it also takes a whole lot for me to really give a shit about body pork pork you know body torture porn and stuff Again, if it's a light week, it's around Halloween. I figured I'd give it a shot, and eh, no, it's better than Dead Mall. Um, next, another one that's in just an odd one. Light week. Most DC books, and I've said this before, are going by the wayside for me, um, unless they're like really extra special. Just because I'm gonna, I, I once I get paid next, I'm gonna sign up for the um, Ultra Mega Your Mom subscription with DC, and I'm just gonna read it digitally. I'll start reviewing them on here. They're probably gonna be a month behind, but. It is what it is. It's cheaper. It's better for the planet. And I don't need to have more books in this tiny little apartment I'm living in. And I, I, you just get to the point where you're like, okay, how many complete series do I need to own? And how many complete whatever do I need to know? Yeah, this is the Riddler. <laughs> um, what is it? Oh, the Riddler year one. There we go. Because you have to have year one if it's a DC book or Bad Day or something. You know, they can't have their own. Just call it their own damn thing. I dig the cover. It's written by Paul Dano, who played the Riddler in The Batman. And the art is by Stevan Subic. I might be butchering the pronunciation there. And I apologize, but like this is probably my favorite art of the week. I dig the art in this book. It's like creepy and gross and gorgeous. And it has a does a decent job of like capturing Paul Dano's likeness as the Joker. And it's got some abstractness to it. It kind of reminds me a bit of Dave McKean, kind of Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, along those vibes. And like, you know, a little bit of use of like collage materials and overlay and alternative uh, methods and means to make the imagery. It's dark, uh, it's gritty, and that fits. And it's also got some like nice visual here. You know, like it's, it's visually, it's gorgeous. Writing wise, it's all right. Um, it, it feels like it's Paul Dano's first comic. It might not be, but it sort of feels like it. Uh, one of the things he does not do as in a writer, which I dig, which I like, is he's not overly verbose. Like a lot of first time comic writers tend to just dump a ton of words at you. This is pretty sparse in that department. Like there is not a lot of dialogue. And there's not a lot of exposition here. Like it, he allows the artist to tell most of the story visually. Um, it's just that the story itself. Pretty predictable, not super interesting at this point. And while it is gorgeous, it mostly like most of this book is just an internal dialogue of what's going on in, in the the Riddler's head. And there are some cheesy like ways that um, 
Dano is tying this Riddler into like the previously established Riddler. So it's better than the others that I've read this week. Uh, it's not amazing, uh, but the art really does elevate it a bit. And it's a rare case for me where I think the art it has more impact than the story. I think they all tend to tie it together, and I think they're necessary for a good comic. And while I don't think this is a great comic, I think it's decent, and I think it, a lot of that has to do with the artwork. So um, if you love the Riddler, if you love the Batman movie, maybe pick this one up, but like, you could also probably just skip it and wait for trade paperback, or read it digitally, like I'm going to do with the rest of this series, because I didn't grab you enough to want to pick this up, even though it is gorgeous. It's got that nice sensibility that kind of tugs in my heartstrings artistically, but it's just not, not, not enough there to grab me. All right. Uh, next we have strange Academy finals. Number one. Um, I thought this was a one shot. It is not, it is like at least a, it may be a, like a, something that's in the interim book. That's going to come back in like season two of, or like, you know, next season, next, whatever, next year's class of whatever you want to, he's going to call it for Strange Academy, but this story does not get completed in this issue, so I was a little surprised by that. Um, it's still Scotty Young telling the story. It's still Urbano Ramos on the art, so that's great. Um, the coloring feels a little weird. I think there might be a different colorist than there were on the previous volume, but I, I, hadn't, I didn't go back and look because that's research, people, and who has time for that? I bought these books today. I'm reading them, and I'm putting the interview out, or putting the review out. That's how fast I roll. I'm fast like a ninja. And it worked out like I got lazy. But yeah, it just feels like really kind of heavy handed with the coloring. Kind of over the top. And it might might be the same colorist that was at the last issues of this stuff, but like it just doesn't quite feel like it did at the beginning of Strange Academy. And I got the characters going on a journey and dark things happen and dark things are happening in this world and darkness is afoot. Um yeah, I just didn't that, the coloring just felt a little off. And also I still like this book. I still think it's entertaining. I still really enjoy the Strange Academy series. Um, and I've loved that what Scotty Young has done with it. And I love what Romero Ramos has done with it. I love that they've done every book together. There's not been a fill-in artist on anything other than there was like a spin-off thing that had a different person, but that wasn't really part of the actual story. It was that tie into some dumb shit. It might have been like King of Black or I can't remember what, what it tied into. It is something stupid. Um, I love that. And what I don't really dig about this is that like there's a character <sighs> motivational shift that seems too sudden and out of a place in this issue. Um, I think it probably was set up a bit in the previous series, the, the Strange Academy, Volume 1, but it didn't really feel like it had gotten to the point that it did in this one. Yet. I feel like we're missing a step or two, and like it's just a little out there. I mean, I get what Scotty Young's going for, and I get like he needed to, I guess, have a reason for this book to exist, but it's a strange one, and it feels like it's a setup. It should have just been another issue of Strange Academy, really, uh, instead of calling it finals, and it should have just continued the story. That's what it feels like. It doesn't feel like a starting over. It doesn't really feel like a new, fresh thing on it. It just feels like, okay, this is the next step of the story after a little bit of a break, which is really all it is, and that's fine, and maybe I'm picking at nits as it were, but I don't know. It's not. It's, again, not bad. Um, still better than most of the schlock Marvel puts out, but it's not, doesn't quite hit the levels that the previous, like, especially the beginning of Strange Academy did for me. Like, I really like the beginning of Strange Academy. I think it faltered a bit towards the end, and I think this is still in line with that falter. So, your mileage may vary. Let me know if you've read it. Let me know what you think of it. It's probably going to be one of the more popular books this week. It was not a heavily week for comics, really. There's, you know, I've got two left. Um, yeah. And next... We have Moon Knight Annual number one. I swear there was already another one of these, but that also might have been a tie-in to some of the... Oh, that was a tie-in to Civil War. All this shit ties into other shit. I'm like, God damn it, Marvel. Just tell stories. Like, tell a one-and-done story in an annual like this is. Uh, this is a one-and-done story. Jed McKay's still writing Moon Knight. I still like his Moon Knight. And it's, in case you couldn't tell, spoilers, the werewolf by night is in it because it's a Halloween-themed thing. I don't know why an annual's coming out after like 18 issues of the first Moon Knight, you know, Moon Knight, but whatever. Um, I dig the cover. The art uh, is by Sabatini, who's not the regular series artist. It's not Capuccio, and it's not quite as good as Capuccio, but it feels like he's trying to like do his best imitation of Capuccio, and it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Like I think his version of uh, Mark Spector is very odd and weirdly boyish. But, the, you know, I, do, I dig his, not to spoil who's in it, but there's one of the characters from Moon Age Past. Um, and then the action sequences really feel like it's trying to be Capuccio. 
doesn't always it does not reach the heights, uh, but it's not not bad for a, for an annual fill in. Uh, the the character of Jack Russell looks weird as hell in here, and like the werewolves themselves are not really well drawn or not well whatever. Um, you'll see. But as far as the story goes, it's a solid one and done. It's not amazing because not much this week is, uh, but it's not bad. Um, you get you you learn some things about some side characters uh, that, that have popped up back in Moon Knight's, Light, Moon Knight's life for this issue, at least. And, yeah, if you're looking for, you know, if, you, if you've been digging Jeb McKay's run, you're probably going to like this book. If you're a big Werewolf by Night fan, you might not care about this one. Um, I'm not really caught up on them all in Moon Knight by Night, Werewolf by Night stories because, I don't know, I like the Marvel one-shot show, but I just never really found the character a lot interesting his name is Jack Russell, and he was a werewolf. And I get it. I like that Universal horror film, but you know, the, the, the concept didn't really grab me as a comic, and uh, still doesn't really, honestly. Uh, it, I don't know. It's it's decent. It, it's it's the second best book of the week, so that's something, right? Right. Also, I need a haircut, and probably get a new job. Or I have a new job, but I need a haircut. And uh, all right, last and best. And I did I put okay. Um, this is Barbaric number three, Axe to Grind number three, the end of volume two. Um, I like that Marici's doing like these little mini volumes here. Um, and the good and on the art. And then, yeah, it's a Barbaric is the, the barbarian is cursed to live forever with a talking bloodthirsty axe that can only kill evil things. And then the axe gets drunk on the blood. That's the setup for the entire series thus far. Um, and this book kind of wraps up volume two in a fun way. It adds a twist to the character. It adds a bit of backstory. It adds um, some like well needed, like depth to the, the, the story because the first volume really was just a set up fun action punch romp. And then this has a lot of that. It has a ton of action, has a ton of fighting, has a ton of like, over the top, like good in in the best kind of ways, Dungeons and Dragons shenanigans and Conan the Barbarian shenanigans going on. Um, but it does have enough, like, of the like, hey, oh, that's some development to keep it interesting. It's it's not high literature, not going to change your life, not going to be like, oh, you know, if, like if you want your comics to be like Alan Moore, it's from hell, highly researched and deep and. You know, annotated and uh, well researched. That's not this. This is just a fun goddamn book, and it's got a fun goddamn. Oh, well, I wonder where this is going to go. Ending. Where you're like, oh, okay, that that's interesting, and it's not the biggest, most unexpected, shocking twist because they kind of hinted at something like this happening throughout this volume. But it's still, it's like, okay, that's solid, and that's the best we get this week is solid. It's yeah, it's a solid fun book. I've been digging Barbaric, and I still like this one. So. That's what we got. Um, yeah, it was not a heavy week for me. I mean, I think a bunch of DC shit came out, but I, I don't know, nothing I really am into. Like, the, I'll read The Dark Crisis when it's all crisis is over, or crisis averted. Maybe they should just have a series called Crisis Averted where nothing happens. I'd buy that. But yeah, we have this shit. This is god-awful. Um, this was not great. Other than Justin's lettering, Justin Birch. He's on YouTube and on Twitter. It's funny on Twitter. Eats pepperoni rolls. Uh, Love Sick, which is translated and a little bit bizarre. Dig the cover. Dig the art. The story is eh. And yeah, gorgeous Riddler. Okay-ish story. Not much of a story, but what there was was okay-ish. Uh, weirdly bizarre characters and musicians, uh, but still fun Strange Academy. And a nice one and done Moon Knight annual. Better than most annuals tend to be. And Barbaric, which is my book of the week. So that's what I've got. Not a, not a, not a whole shitload out here. Um, for those of you that did donate to the Comics Cure Cancer last week, that was awesome of you. I appreciate it. And, you know, the, the community managed to raise over $20,000 for the American Cancer Society. That's fantastic. Um, big shout out to Rob Fatstacks, who did a lot of the heavy lifting and organized the event and, like, just kind of was a beast of a man running a marathon thing all weekend long. I don't think he slept all weekend. I still don't think he slept. And a uh, big shout out. And shout out to everybody else that helped and participated. It was awesome. Great to see the community come together and great to see all these great things happen. If you did not get a chance to donate and you still want to, you can hit up Rob, Fat, Rob's Fat Stacks. Just Google him on here and he still has the, like the donation links open. Otherwise, you know, maybe think about it next year because like it turn, it's turning into a pretty big event, fighting something that's affected everybody's lives. And it's just, you know, it's a worthy cause. So, that's all I've got. I'm going to get the hell out of here and, I don't know, make a sandwich or some shit. So, don't be a dick. I'll see y'all.
next week, probably.